Welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Rowan. Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual. And Bear 52 are back on board this week. We've teamed up with them for the Six Nations to bring you free beers sourced and curated from the very best breweries on the planet delivered straight to your door. Each case of eight free beers comes with an award-winning beer magazine and some snacks as well. And there's no minimum commitment. So you can just take the free case, try the beers, see what you think, and you can pause or cancel at any point. All you need to do is go to beer52.com forward slash rugby and cover the postage. That's the word beer followed by the number 52.com forward slash rugby to get your first case of eight beers for free and you'll be supporting the rugby pod as well. You're going to need those this weekend, Jim, when England absolutely pulled Scotland's pants down at Twickenham. Drown your what? sorrows, pal. What, just, like, get, just get eight English beers and drown your sorrows. What, like Quinn's pulling wasp pants down and nearly putting 50? <laughs> <laughs> What happened? Did that happen? I mean, that I've happened. Been, I've not seen it. I've been on drugs all weekend because of my uh, operation. So uh, I am absolutely fucked. Are you recording the podcast? I don't know why I'm asking. I can see. I think that looks like a bed. What do you call it? A bedpost? A bed, a, headrest? Headrest? Yeah, it's a big old bed, mate. It's a yeah. su- super emperor, I think they call it. Of course it is, mate. The emperor. <laughs> hey, of course it is. Pablo, Pablo the emperor. Does Pablo sleep on there as well or not? No, Pablo does not. This is where the magic happens. And I say the magic. Oh. Uh, it's about 30 seconds of me giving it my best shot and the missus being disappointed, I'd say. But yeah, I'm doing it from bed. I'm, I'm here for the troops. I had my ankle pinned ankle. and plated. The gout removed. On Friday. Basically, um, they broke my tibia and fibula. Sorry. Basically, they broke my tibia and fibula, cracked into the bone as well, put a something in there to widen it, straighten them all up, put a load clamp. of pins. A clamp. Yeah. A clamp. Yeah, a clamp, a clamp, put a load of pins in there, plates in there, galore. I am, I've been on so many drugs. Tramadol, oh my Tramadol, that's all I'm saying. Andy Rowe, I went on your stag do over the weekend. It was unbelievable in Ibiza. How <laughs> was it? How uh, was it, people? <laughs> Mate, it was unbelievable. I had, six, I had a six pack. There was, I was tops off on the beach uh, at the pool parties. I can't remember anyone else being there, but- How I had did I look? Was I not there? Mate, I don't know. I had the time of my life. Pretend I was, I was there. Pretend I was there. Jim, you were there looking How did I look? hot as shit. Really? <laughs> you, had your, <laughs> you had your aviators on. Uh, looking T-shirt cool. on. T-shirt would definitely no, been on. Mate, you went for a vest. You had a vest on. Oh, okay. All right. Cyclist like, arms, yeah. Yeah, so you had your tats out on your arms. But you, you went for the old um, denim jeans, which I wasn't sure about. Yeah. The den- denim jean shorts. Yeah, so uh, it was the best time of my life and then I've woken up and I'm in a pool of sweat with my leg absolutely throbbing like fuck because I've had pins in a plate putting it but tell the tramadol that boys I don't know whether you're telling me the tramadol I kind of want some <laughs> if, it ta- if it takes me to another planet another place behind the laptop another layer a three-dimensional world anything another world then yeah. I might take them but waking up in sweats like the Hong Kong like the weekend, like the week after Hong Kong, you wake up with them sweats. It's just like fear. It's like who, what, where? Mate, I'm, t- I'm telling you now, what I'm waking up with now is worse than the fear that we had in Hong Kong. Um, like I went to. It's, it's quite interesting. So you, you, you wake, you you waking up with Pablo. I'm I'm a bit annoyed really with the missus because she's got rid of Pablo for a few weeks, uh, and since I came home on Saturday, all she's fed me is a few grapes. I'm fucking starving and I'm raging. I need some food. Um, so yeah, it was it was just surreal really because you you've been there, Jim, when you've had an operation. And the whole thing comes around when the anaesthetist comes in and, you know, starts, puts you on the bed and fills you up with a few drugs. And you're like, oh, this is the best feeling in the world. And you're just happy. You love everyone. And you're just thinking, oh, what a feeling. And then you wake up three hours later. You haven't got a fucking clue where you are. You're abusing the nurse because you're in agony. I'm like, what have you done to my leg? Um, you're still so- overweight. There's no, there's no gastric badge. You're, you've still got the extra <laughs> You're like, what's going on? Exactly. Breathe. I went... Yeah, I went in for a new weave, a bit of liposuction and a new ankle, and I've only come out with a new ankle. And that's fucking killing me right now. So, um, yeah, times times are good. I'm waiting, for times the, are good. I'm waiting for the pictures to do the rounds of the of the willy picks that were taken on the operating table because <laughs> I'm telling you now, the operations that I've had, the, the dehydration, and it must be minus 45, and then they must <laughs> operate on me in a freezer because yeah. when I come back round, I can't <laughs> wee... I can't see it. It's <laughs> it's so little. It's um, but yeah. But I'm glad you're all right anyway. I'm glad you're all right. Pablo's apparently not working anymore. Have you been downstairs or not? 
Uh, I went down once today and told the sweats that go downstairs. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that, that gave Pablo 15 minutes to get into the store cupboard. So Pablo's <laughs> not working these last, yeah, last few days. Yeah, of course. How are you, Jimbo? How's your win? I'm buoyant. I'm buoyed. This is good. I'm the boy. Uh, energised this, uh, this week. Um, had a really good weekend, actually. Um, and it came at a good time for me personally. The last couple of weeks, I've been feeling quite down. The kids are running up the walls because they're not at school. But we did, or we have been, as you know, Andy Rome and the podcast listeners, we've been running this Doddy Aid uh, challenge throughout January. We're obviously now into February. We're into the last week. And today, we're recording a day later on Tuesday, the message come through. Over a million pound raised. So unbelievable stuff. And for any of the listeners and the viewers that have, have got involved in the Doddy Aid challenge, doddyaid.com challenge. Uh, your snoots will be coming soon. Bl genuinely blame China. They've come from China. <laughs> They've taken a while. I don't want to get political, but I don't know what's happening at the borders. There's something happening over on the continent. They're coming from China, but they're now in Scotland, which is a good thing. Good, you might beg to differ than being in Scotland might be a good thing, but they are, and they're going to be delivered. So apologies for the delay, but the main thing is, is that we've raised over a million pounds. And on Saturday, I joined the World in a Day cycle. Um, I did three different stints. I did about an hour or so. And you have people on there cycling on static bikes. Some were rowing 240 odd miles, 280 miles individually to raise money. And we had a few oh. different guests on. It was mental. So hugely inspired by that. It made me very upbeat. I was thinking about Goody. I was thinking about Pablo downstairs, but he's not there, he, he, he's at home, uh, whilst Goody was doing that. And I was, I was happy to be healthy and happy that I was involved in an amazing cause. And, you know, ultimately, without going too deep about it, when I spoke to the thousands of people that were cycling and we were all on Zoom, we were talking about it. We were talking about the lockdown situation that we are clearly in now, the highs and the lows of it. And I've been low the last couple of weeks. I'm high this week. Uh, Goody is probably high because of the tramadol. And <laughs> to be a part of the Doddy Challenge and the solution to finding a cure for MND via the amount of money we're trying to raise to do that is I feel that I've had a bit of a purpose this month. And the money that's gone into the pot, and I think that everyone involved in that challenge it's credit to them because if, and the, and the rumors and stuff that's coming out in the news, that the science is now accelerating because of the money that's been raised, Rob Burrow, Ken Sinfield raised over a million pounds. We've raised over a million pounds this last month. And that gives me a real purpose and real energy to talk about it now. So just to reiterate, thank you to everyone who got involved. The snoods are on the way. Like everything, blame China. If and the there. EU. Blame the EU as well, because they got stuck there. Well, yeah, exactly. Something happened over that. I don't know. I don't know what's happened with Northern Ireland. I'm just seeing all this stuff, all this white noise. All I know is I was on the bike. I looked fucking incredible on there. And I was a millionaire for about a second when I saw that come through. I realised it weren't mine. It was going to a higher cause. And for that, I'm very proud. Yeah. Mate, it's phenomenal what everyone's done, and it's you know not just the rugby community, but the community, the community across the world, doesn't it? So you know, Andy Rowe, you got involved as well. I saw you cycling past Buckingham Palace, was it? Yeah. How do we go on the bike? Cold though. Hard, hard, hard to hit the target. How'd you go to your target, Jim? Goody. I had to take a zero off mine. I had two thousand five hundred miles, and then I just took a zero off because I'm blaming the weather. Not that I'm a man of excuses. I'm normally. You know, as a leader, as a captain, I'll get out there, wind, rain, or shine. But it was it, it wasn't any of them. It was it's been snowing. And my life matters to a lot of people, you know. And if I'm falling off my bike, breaking arms and legs, I can't be the dad that I need to be. You know, I need to be able to press that button on the TV remote and turn Netflix off and put <laughs> Disney Plus TV on. And if I can't do that, I ain't a good dad. So, so with that in mind. I went from 2,500 miles down to 250, but I did 350. So, oh, um, so I've actually gone over the predicted miles that were predicted with an extra zero, if you get what I mean. So I've done quite a lot. I wouldn't say an extra zero, I'd just say an extra 100. But minus the, what was it, 2,150 that you didn't do. 
Yeah, don't worry. How many were you? Hell of an effort anyway, mate. Hell of an effort. Well, they stopped me playing oh. golf. They stopped me playing golf. I can't run. I couldn't cycle. My ankle's fucked. Um, but I, partic- I donated. Let's just say I, I donated. You went in calorie intake. You've got a number in there and you've gone daily calorie <laughs> intake, 5,000 liquid miles. Boom, I'll take it. Yeah. And that's uh, Well, the calories are down, mate. Just eating grapes and a couple of yogurts. I need to get my calories up. Stop saying grapes. It makes you feel really weird. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the grapes that you're thinking about. These are cold. How good is a cold, hard grape that you just crunch in your mouth? Is this cold? I realised. Is this cold? No, it's not cold. Green well, ones? it is. Yeah, for me, it is because it's right? it's fruit, mate. Green, green or red, just seedless. Just send the missus to M&S. Grapes are available in other stores, and off you go. She's uh, she's getting my fruit intake up there. As I've been thinking about you, Andrew, and in your big what's it called, a penguin bed. Super, super, super Emperor, I think it's called. Okay, I don't know where I've aligned Penguin with that. <laughs> Emperor Penguin. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Chuchun. I had this chat with Beck because we don't have anything else to talk about apart from saying to each other, I know if the kids have been, we need to shout less. And Jim, do you want to help out with the schoolwork? That's the constant circle that we talk about. Interesting chat, very boring for the listeners, but I'm interested to know, front or back, do you sleep on your front or sleep on your back? Uh, I f- sleep on my back and sides. Sides. Um, yeah. Sides. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a go on one side, you get a bit hot on that side, and then you have to get your ass out the duvet the other side, don't you? Andy Rowe? Um, front and side. Front? Who sleeps on their front? It's easier to breathe, though, isn't it? Because yeah. Apparently, it's bad to sleep on your front. Now, I don't know if Is there's it? any sleep, sleep doctors out there. Apparently, sleeping on your front ain't good for you. I got told actually when I woke up from the operation I might have sleep apnea, which is basically where you no. stop. Yeah, no. where you stop. Yeah. Where you we stop saw. breathing. <laughs> exactly. This if, if anyone was going to have sleep apnea, yeah. Well, if anyone was going to have sleep apnea, it was going to be you, Andrew. Uh, they, they, you are, I, again, not being a sleep doctor, but I probably should be. You look like a man who would have sleep apnea. I, I sleep like a king, to be honest. Uh, but maybe I just don't breathe all the way through it. So. Well, we'll have a look at the premiership action from last weekend later on because Please. you know yes, Goody really, really wants to talk about how Wasp took 50. <gasps> but the Six Nations starts again this weekend and it's Scotland's year, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> they say this every year. Over to Jim Hamilton to talk absolute garbage about Scotland have got a chance. This is our year. We're building. Finn's <laughs> back. We might win one game. We might win to fuck it. We're going to win the Grand Slam. Here we go. go over to you, Jim. I'm going to put in the phrase or the two words that I used a couple of weeks ago on this podcast about the situation we find ourselves in. I'm going to use the same analogy for when I talk about Scotland. Shit. Who knows? Oh, so no, that's one word. That's one word. <laughs> Who knows? Absolutely shit. Oh. Who knows? If you look at Scotland, right, in terms of the proteins, we, they, it'd be we if they were performing well. They haven't been performing very well. So you look at that and you're thinking, we might struggle a little bit. You throw into the mix, we've got a bit of Finn back. He ain't struggling for form. He should be pretty good. You put into the mix that England are struggling up front with a few players injured in the scrum. Is that going to come into it? You put into the fact that there's no fans. So does that take the edge off the game for the Scotland players? And then you come back, I put that all into the mixer, put that into an equation and it comes out with... Who knows? I was going to say, all you need to worry about is the, the last game. Your fifth game is the wooden spoon decider, as ever, at Murrayfield against Italy. I don't think that far in front. Don't think that far in front, Andrew. <laughs> I'm just trying, so, to think of a vi- I'm trying to think of a victory for you, because that's possibly the only one you're going to get, is it? Uh, we'll see. It might be... Look, if, if you're asking me, my expert opinion, and I'm there, pitch side, believe it or not, picture the scenario. I'm there at Twickenham on Saturday... I've got to drive down on Friday because not allowed to fly or train, be in a safe bubble or whatever, which would be lovely. I'm actually going to leave on Wednesday, to be fair. (laughs) Um, I've got to be at Twickenham on Saturday and I'm leaving Wednesday just to be safe, to get there. And then I'll be travelling back up on the following Wednesday. Just I don't want to be too tired driving, energy (laughs) expended. But I'm there with Sir Cliff, I mean Sir Clive, and Johnny Wilkinson in an outdoor studio. So you've got two World Cup heroes and you've got the Bushwhacker gym with them. The side of it. Can nice. you imagine? I've made it. Mate, I've made I'm, it. I'm, I'm so happy that you're there 
for that pitch side analysis, pre-match, half-time, post-match, because you know, you've got two English legends there in terms of the 03 World Cup. Johnny's a legend, you know, as a player, phenomenal. Um, as a pitch side or studio analyst, like if you want to go to sleep, you either listen to Andy Rose podcast or Johnny Wilkinson and to Clive Woodward at half time. <laughs> Don't um, you say so, that about Johnny Wilkinson. The guy <laughs> is he's a god. He is, he is, he is. And Sir Clive will just go on about the 03. See how see how quickly it takes Sir Cliff Woodwork to get in talking about drop goals or anything like that. Did I call in Cliff or not? Is this because this went viral on social after we were in the studio before I dominated Paul O'Connell before the World Cup. Apparently I called Clive Sir Cliff. Is this <laughs> I then look back in the archives? <laughs> I think you called him Clive Woodward and then you called Ian McGeekin Sir Ian. So you went Clive, who is a Sir, so you could have called him Sir Clive, but you just called him Clive. It's, it's but then you also it. called Sir Ian, Sir Ian. So you showed respect to a Scotsman, but a lack of respect to an Englishman. And they are both Sirs. But this weekend, just call him Sir Cliff. Is Johnny a Sir? No, he's not. He's, he should he's, be, will be. Is he an OBE or a CBE? Call him Sir Johnny and just call him Cliff Woodwork. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so I'm there anyway. So I'm there holding the fort for the Scotland It'd be amazing. Passes. And I'm, I'm so pleased. Gen genuinely, genuinely, I'm dead chuffed for you, mate, because uh, that's proper top tier punditry and Incredible. you can put them to shame. Mate, you can put them to shame with the new way of doing punditry. It's not straight down the line, oh, you know, it's, it's a good game. We've got to come out with something. I'm wearing shoes. I'm wearing shoes, just, though. Just say Finn's Bush. Just get something out there that goes down in folklore as this is the new way of doing pitch side punditry. Do you know what, what term I'm going to use? Two words. Go on. Go on. Who knows? Who knows? Yes. Who knows? There we go. Revolutionary. Can't wait, to, can't wait to watch it. They ain't going to hear nothing like it. They're getting a who knows. Um, I'll give you one more line before Gooley talks about why England are going to put 50. Uh, they're going to put a quince on wasps. Oh! Scotland, we have got a chance, but we, if we're going to go into a bit of detail about it, we're not very good at taking our chances close to the try line. Most of the teams now, most of the top five teams, when they get a sniff of the try line, they're over. Scotland, there's, we've got too many errors in us. So we might be able to pull something out of the bag. You know, Finn playing at 10, the teams won't get a national Thursday, I don't think. Let's talk of Cam Redpath path playing 12. We've got Duan van der Merwe on the wing who scored a wonder try against Ireland can unlock defences. There's talk of Gary Graham potentially playing eight. Jamie Ritchie, if he's fit. Hamish Watson, we've got a really good back row. Johnny Gray, Scott Cummins in the second row, two quality players. We're down to our third choice hooker. So hopefully that won't be a problem. George Turner is a wicked player in the loose, but it's about set piece at the highest level. Hoggy at 15, he didn't get much opportunity in the last few games that he's played, but we know how good he is. Darcy Graham on the other wing. So that we've now got a quality of players. It's just about, again, without giving you rugby laws jargon, it's about just putting it together. And we notoriously don't start very well the first game of the tournament. So look at the World Cup, 28-0 or whatever it was against Ireland. You look at when we went to Wales a couple of years ago, first game, John Barkley spoke about it before. Apparently Scotland were favourites, got absolutely hosed in that game as well. Notoriously, we do not start tournaments well. World Cup 2011, we nearly got beat by fucking Romania in the first game. So, <laughs> I, I weren't playing. Was that your, was I that your playing. Oh, no. no, I weren't playing. I played against Georgia and I'm the week, the week after 9-3. So, <laughs> notoriously, we don't start, start tournaments that well. Jim, where is Scotland going to finish on the ladder? Fourth. Fifth. Oh. I'm, I'm oh okay. Okay. Fourth or fifth. Goody, you're going to be lying at home on the tramadols, but what do you what do you think of how the game's going to pan out this weekend? Um, I mean, it is uh, so many parameters that make it tough to call. I think England are, are favourites and relatively big favourites as well. We are tough to beat. But when you look at the nuts and bolts of this England team at the minute, the injuries that we've got up front, the fact that Jamie George hasn't played since December, nor has Mara Toji. Billy's only played against Ealing Trailblazers. Um, obviously, Owen Farrell will play. He hasn't played since then. And they're, they're not excuses, but they're reasons that, a bit of doubt could creep in if you're outside the camp. Um, uh, you know, you're hearing rumblings of these boys, Elliot Daly as well, another one. These boys are, are, you know, fired up, ready to go. They're well rested. And so it's like sometimes you come off the back of a load of games 
and you go into the Six Nations. So ordinarily, they'd have come off the back of a couple of European games and then gone into camp. So you've, you're either battle-hardened or you've carried a niggle. There's no excuse for those boys to have niggles. Um, and I don't know, I just... The effect of having no fans there, you know, that rivalry with Scotland and England over the last three years has been absolutely massive. Um, you know, you go back to the game two years ago when, or well, three years ago now, actually up at Murrayfield when Scotland got in, yeah, Scotland got in England's faces and ended up winning the Calcutta Cup, you know, the bit kicked off before the game. A lot of that was the emotion driven around the occasion. Now you've got to provide your own emotion this week. Um, and England, uh, you know, they're used to winning. They're used to playing a comfortable style for them that isn't flash. Uh, it's just damn effective. And, you know, you're hearing some of the quotes that come out, Maratoji ain't bothered whether he gets caught, the England team get called boring or whatever. It's all about winning. Eddie Jones talks about the team being impossible to play against. Um, and they're just going to make themselves harder and harder to beat. And that is around discipline. That's around physicality, around set piece. Um, and, you know, winning that kicking battle. Now, I've got no doubt Scotland have got a couple of absolute world-class game breakers in Finn Russell and Stuart Hogg that can cause England massive troubles. But when you see those two playing at club level, they're surrounded by top quality players as well in those competitions, and they shine. Is there a lot of expectation on those two boys to be the the difference? Are they going to try? Is Finn going to try too much because this is a massive stage for him? You know, and let's not beat around Jim's bush. When the game two years ago at Twickenham, when it was 31 nil, I think, to England, Scotland had nothing to lose. Finn bought the magic out and ended up being 38 31 to Scotland. And then George Ford saves the day with a try under the sticks after coming on as a sub to, you know, to keep our record intact at Twickenham. Let's not forget. Scotland haven't won at Twickenham since, what is it, 1984 uh, or something? I, I might have been one or two. Don't worry about history, Gary. No, I know, I, I, but it, I'm just saying, you know, that is the history of it. Does that help Scotland this week that there's no fans there? Possibly. Um, you know, when you're having to create your own emotion and uh, noise, uh, you know, does Finn get the same buzz off trying things in an empty stadium as he does in a full stadium? Who knows? Um, but you know, Scotland have threats. Let's not. I, I come on here a bit jovial sometimes and dismiss Scotland because it's Jim and it's a bit of banter between us. But it wouldn't surprise me if Scotland put on a hell of a show and took England to the wire. It really wouldn't. But it also wouldn't surprise me if England won this comfortably by thirty points. And that's not being arrogant. It's like Jim says. Who knows what's coming? I think England are big favourites. They've can Scotland cope with England's power up front, and that's even without Mako. So you again, you'll start. He's an animal when he wants to be ball in hand. Um, Jamie George, world-class player. Um, uh, will Stewart, will he start a tight head or will Harry Williams start? You've got Marrow in the second row. Does he start with Courtney Laws or Johnny Hill? You know, both quality, quality players. You know, the back row will be Billy, probably Mark Wilson and uh, Curry. You know, I think Ben Earl will probably come off the bench. So, you know, the fact that we're missing a few, you still name that team. And geez, it's, it's a phenomenal forward pack. And I think... England's power, England's ability to put so much pressure on opposition uh, and play the the brand of rugby at the plant at the minute, it's not exciting. We ain't going to chuck it around from everywhere, but it'll be damn effective. And, you know, you could equally see a 20, 30 point England victory. Well, that's the thing with England. When was the last time you've seen them get hammered? Maybe the final against South Africa, but even before that, I can't remember England getting hammered. Scotland have got it in them. Not to take a fifth, not to take a, a Quins and Wasp, uh, but they've got it in them to take a few points if it doesn't go well for them. And we saw that, like you said, at that game two years ago. I could be one of the greatest games in the professional era, or even yeah. ever. It, it, it was ridiculous. But to be down 31 points to seven or whatever it was at half time, and it was unreal to be able to bring that back. But Scotland have got it in them. Look at the World Cup to get hammered still. So hopefully that isn't the case. Um but as I say, if you're going to get... Hopefully it is. Oh, you want Scotland to get hammered, do you? Yeah, because that means England have won comfortably and we're on our way to a Grand Slam. There we go again. There we go. <laughs> Thinking about the Grand Slam. Well, many consider England favourites after winning the 2026 Nations and the Autumn Nations Cup. And we can have a chat now with their defence coach, John Mitchell, can't we? We're getting a world exclusive here. Let's just pretend that because you've just uh, come out in the media that you've signed a new contract. So let's just pretend that it's a world exclusive just for the rugby part. <laughs> you've decided to stick with the wind and rain 
and the lockdown and no fans. Um, what made you come to that decision? Obviously, massive news for England. You, you've had a huge impact on that team. A really easy decision, uh, Jim and Eddie. Like it's um, for me. Um, I really enjoy the professional environment uh, that w- that's presented here. Uh, it's a real uh, learning environment as well. Uh, there's plenty of upside in the in the player group, um, and then there's the fact just that you know, uh, being in this environment, you know, you've got to evolve. Um, you've got to challenge to be you know to bring better practices. Uh, uh, to the players, but I think the the main thing I think a, a bit of experience coming in, in here now, and what's not something I've always done pretty well, is that yeah, you know, like you just tend to take for granted. Um, it takes bloody time to to build relationships with people, and and I just think I'm at a at a stage where with that investment in relationships, uh, you can can pay off even more uh, going going forward because um, it's um, you know, and also. Pretty, pretty grateful as well, mate. Like it's a tough world out there, um, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm just excited by the energy and the desire of the player group wanting to get better. And to me, that's something I want to be part of. Yeah, definitely. And was it a case of um, the fact that Eddie Jones and Matt Proudfoot had to go into self isolation that you could write your own check for this one because you were the only senior coach that could go into camp on time? So you've written your own check, and it starts with a five or a six. <laughs> the uh, the um, actually um, thank God we did lockdown uh, for a bloody long time. Obviously, in the first one where we all got used to virtual, so uh, there was still plenty of virtual going on, mate. Um, even when we we're up in St George's, uh, it was pretty cold as well. Uh, but yeah, now we we got Eddie back and Matt back, um, uh, yeah, reasonably quickly, um, and so the the ball uh, the the ball kept moving and the boys uh, boys got into it. So. Um, yeah, it was a cold campaign. Eh? Like it, we even got snow one of the days. On a whole, how do you look at this Scotland team evolving? Yeah, this team's um, this team's good. Eh? Um, yeah, I mean, Scotland have always been a tough opponent. Experience uh, it confirms that. I um, mean, the last three fixtures uh, confirm that between the, the you know the countries. Um, but for me, is like they've changed their game slightly. You know, since the World Cup, they seem to be more more into, you know, got, you know, tried the World Cup with a possession-based type style. Then have come probably coming in to more to a contestable kick approach and, and you know, obviously want to feed, feed off, you know, counter-attack and, um, and um, some crumbs, you know, from the air. So, yeah, and they, um, you yeah, know, they, they set piece well uh, and they have clearly got the ability to contest on, on the floor. So they've got, they've got a number of strengths, you know, like... Um, uh, so that, yeah, to me, and they're, they're growing as a, as, a, as a group. You know, effectively in Scotland, people still believe that the Calcutta Cup's here. Two years ago, 38 all draw, which effectively Scotland feel like they won. Last year's game was basically a non-start because the game was so poor with the conditions. So there's a feeling in Scotland that we've still got the Calcutta Cup here. You do know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was atrocious conditions last year, wasn't it? Um, and uh, you know, we we got the upper hand that day, and then the, that in 2019, you know, like yeah, uh, you know, we had a pretty good first half, and then you know Scotland had a terrific second half, and we we did extremely well to uh, to, to to get the draw. So um, you know, the, the, yeah, the great thing about the fixtures, you just can't button off, you know, at any point in time, and the and the performance, and if you do, you know, like um, you, you can get hurt. So. Yeah, this is a, this is an 80, 80 minute plus for us. Yeah, like um, there's going to be times where we're going to have to absorb. It's going to be at times where we're not we're going to be untidy. Um, so we're going to have to endure all that um, and be resilient and, and stay calm because yeah, you know, like it's a great fixture. There'll be plenty of pressure. Yeah, plenty of havoc. Yeah, like um, yeah, no, it's it's always a it's always a really good test match. Yeah, it certainly will be. And, and looking at what you've done before, John, I love the video of you putting your scrum cap on and the Italy shirt back in November time, um, <laughs> barring up for, for a contact session. Who's dressing up as Finn Russell this week? Have you got the skill set to pull that off in the opposition's attack going against your defence? Or is someone else out there pretending to be Finn Russell to put the boys under pressure at training this week? <laughs> you know, we, um, we, we like to bring a bit of creativity um, uh, to, to the working week. Um, so we'll see... So what we've got up our, up our sleeve this week, but um, you know, going back to Finn, mate, um, yeah, he's uh, probably the best uh, best fly off in the world in terms of attacking kick. Um, you know, he sees space well. Um, you know, he can play off the cuff. Um, 
you know, you can look for self as well, you know, like in, in slow situations. So you really, your anticipation and your awareness, you know, of, of that area, you have to sort of kind of take it away from, but, you know, like you, as you guys know, you defensively, you can't, you can't defend for all the space. Um, you know, like, and um, there's always something you leave open and he has the ability to find it. So, you know, we're going to have to work um, extremely, uh, what's the word, cohesively um, as, a, as a backfield and as a, as a nine to make sure that we can anticipate, um, can anticipate those attacking kicks. Um, but ultimately, end of the day, he's also going to, going to receive pressure as well. Um, so it's, it's, what's important there is that we've got to have the constant energy and, and, and desire to create that, uh, to create that pressure. So the, the those opportunities become less and less for them. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of the focus is going to be on Finn Russell back in the Scotland team after last year not being part of the Six Nations. Um, but let's focus on England. It, it must be pretty difficult at the minute to uh, have the preparation that we've had. And we've seen we've got a few injuries. Uh, a few of the Saracens players haven't played since the autumn. Focusing on ourselves, how important has this training week been so far? And uh, the boys will be raring to go shortly by the weekend. No rustiness yeah. at all you're worried about? Um, responded really well in, in camp. Um, yeah, we have a strong training methodology that's often talked about. Um, players are ripped in, uh, energy, effort, all, all those things, all those factors that you would expect anyway to be good um, coming in. So the, they're there, but it's like anything, you know, everything I should say was we always want to get better at our basics, making sure that our basics, um, you know, handle, handle pressure. Um, and I, you know, like um, obviously we're into the second day now of, of test week, so the, you know, the the pressure of training um, and competition will step up. Um, so you can you can really sense there is a there, there is a test week and there's something something awesome, you know, to aspire to at the at, at, the, at the end of the week. So um, yes, the, I mean we've got some energy from from some some new youth and we've got some some good experience and. Yeah, going back to the guys that are that are that the perception that haven't played a lot of rugby is that normally you know what you know what it's like it's pretty pretty much a slog for most of the guys having coming out of Europe um, in the past, whereas really you know some of the guys have had a it almost like it's been an excellent preseason. So mentally and physically, they're they're very fresh and they're very keen to get at it. So to me, that's um, that's uh, that's a huge advantage to us. Yeah, John. Just lastly, from uh, from me. Always wondered in the England team, a team that's so successful, obviously made the final of the World Cup, littered with fantastic players. It's how do you measure success in the tournament? So you go into the Six Nations. What does success look like for this England team? Yeah, success for us is that we we want to get we want to get better. Um, you know, number one, we've got to win. You know, number two, we want to c create healthy competition uh, for players because if we create that, then um, then you got players pushing each other each other. And then that drives performance up. Um, so yeah, our, our, our performance is we 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 want to get better. We want to be challenged. Yeah, we just we want people to come at us, and um, and and we expect that. And um, and ultimately, end of the day, those challenges are going to going to make us stronger. There'll be a lot along the along the road. There'll be at times you know, a little bit of disappointment here and there. Yeah, but that's something you got to handle, isn't it? If you if you if you want to get better. So um, um, yeah, there's a lot of unfinished potential within this group and we've we've got to we've got to realize it as well so we're just going to take another step in the six nations yeah good stuff and lastly for me um a bit of a, a looser one for example we know eddie jones brings his dog to train at sometimes um is there someone the young kids paolo or dog group perhaps new in the camp harry randall are they having to walk his dog or uh, does eddie do that himself it <laughs> is no, uh, uh he looks after his, his dog himself um the uh at the moment, I think uh, we're trying to work out who the, who the tallest is between Harry Randall and uh, and, and Simon uh, Simon <laughs> Amor. So uh, there's a bit of a uh, competition going on there. Nice, good stuff, good stuff. Appreciate it. Well, best of luck for the Six Nations, and let's hope we're Grand Slam champions. Yeah, cheers, Andy. Thank you. Good bloke. Good lad. Good bloke. Good bloke. Good bloke. I think what I've got from that good is maybe all that I've got from that is they just want to get better. <laughs> they do. Don't know. They I do. Don't That's know. their mantra. I don't know. I don't want to judge and try and overthink what he was saying, but I think they just want to improve day in, day yeah. out and game on game. Yeah. And also we don't know who's taller, Harry Randall or Simon Amor, but I need to know who walk it, but I need to know who's walking Eddie's dog. 
It must be George Ford. That's the only way he's getting in the team. It can't be on form, can it? But hey, listen, it was great to have him on. Um, you know, good bloke. He, um, you know, he spoke frankly about signing his new contract, which, you know, he, he's got every reason to. And he was honest about the situation, the pandemic we're in. He's delighted to be able to sign a new contract. So, um, yeah, really nice to have him on. And uh, here's for a massive England victory, eh, Jim? And he called me Jimmy. There's only one other person in my life that calls me Jimmy. Who's that? Well, there was two. There was two. My mum, yeah. calls, who calls me Jimmy, and Papa used to call me Jimmy. Uh, rest in peace. So, and two people. And John Mitchell, England defence coach. He most likely. There you go. How do you think Wales is going to get on? And what, what does a satisfactory tournament look like? for Wayne Pivak in the eyes of the WRU and the Welsh public? Jeez, I mean, pressure. It's not, yeah, it's hard one, isn't it? Like Freddie Mercury said, under pressure. Do, 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 do. That could get copyrighted, it sounded that good. Um, <laughs> whatever you think. He is a man under pressure, that is for sure. So what does success look like for Wales? <sighs> did, did you put a number where they finish? Is it... Not, is it not winning the wooden spoon? I don't, I don't want to be horrible. No, it's but. hard, isn't it? It is really hard. It's a it's hard tournament to call this year, isn't it? Because you can make arguments for a lot of teams to come with some form. You know, Wales, could they bounce back? Are they going to continue on this, you know, poor run of form? You know, people talk about Wayne Pivak being under pressure. Um, you know, are they going to get rid of him at the end of the Six Nations if things don't improve? Well, you look around the world going who's there for the job. So unless you go Scott Robertson. Um, so is he under pressure for his job? I don't know. Is it too late to change him now? Pre-World Cup in um, 2023? I, I, who knows? They've had some injuries, haven't they? They've had a lot of misfortune around that. Um, you know, they've had you've some... Got, you've, you've, got, you, you've got to stick with him. Like they, yeah. You can't... The issue for them is, is there's no... Like no gaps. There's no gaps. Yeah. There's no gaps. Well, there's no gas and the pressure of having their first home game against Ireland. Now, you remember Scotland in the Autumn Nations Cup? You might not remember. I do remember because I'm Scotland till I die. Went down to Wales and albeit not the Principality. And that's maybe the thing for Wales is under Pivak, you've got to feel for him. He, you know, he's, I don't know how many games he plays at the Principality. No fans. Wales is all built on playing home games, in my opinion, with the emotion. And he hasn't had that and neither of the players so I do feel for him. I, I, I don't want to see him get sacked. But you play against Ireland first game and really on form. And if you look at it, Ireland could win that comfortably. But they just think they I, I think they might. Where's Ireland's form? But Leinster's. Yeah, but I, I think the quality of players. Now, Ireland's a different discussion around Sexton, don't be horrible, being captain, is he fit at 10? But you look at the form of the players and the level that they're playing at, it sounds like I'm being really harsh in Welsh. I'm not. I love Welsh people and I love the emotion that Wales bring. One of my favourite teams to play against because of the emotion that them games are charged with. But everything, in my opinion, IMO, is stacked against Wales. The pressure that Pivak's under, Alan Wynne-Jones, is he fit? Is he back? He's captain. Is he good enough to play international oh. rugby still? I know. I know. It's hey, horrible. Why are you being horrible? It's why horrible. Being horrible, Jim? I, why it's are horrible. you being horrible? It's horrible. It's a horrible thing to say. You know, you've got George North in the team, Lee Halfpenny, unbelievable servants to rugby. But, you know, it, 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 Ireland have got James Lowe, who is hungry, hungry as a testosterone fueled ball. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Lee Halfpenny ain't got them. He's given a lot of it away. He's got two or three kids. You know, George North is, <laughs> you know, I'm sure he's got a bit of testosterone. But James Lowe, is, about. he is screaming. He is screaming with energy. You know, you look at the centre partnership that Ireland can put out with Ringrose and, and Henshaw and James Ryan, just getting better and better. Just, the, you, know, you know, the energy in that, back, whatever back row that they want to put out, I just feel like... I don't know. Maybe I'm Irish. Maybe maybe yeah. part of my testosterone is Irish. I get your points, Jim. But you look at the Wales team, and potentially you could have half penny at fullback, George North on the wing, Jonathan Davis and Owen Watkin in the centres, Josh Adams on the other wing, Dan Bigger and Thomas Williams at halfbacks. I mean, that is a quality backline. So 
you know, Ken Owens is back supposedly um, at hooker as well. You know, is Alan Jones fit? That's the big question. Dan Lydia, he's back. I think he's awesome. Um, Man, Dan, you know, he's quality, can... Mate, Dan Lydia is, is a quality player, but he's he's a club player now. Oh, just, mate, you're horrible. Way, you're horrible. It's, it's, way, it's yeah. not. It's, he, he's, he, he's, he's a quality player. He, he is, but you look at the island back row. Look, look at the numbers that they're outputting. Look at what they do internationally. Yeah. yeah. I'm, the, I'm. What I'm saying is Ireland are favourites, but this Wales team, you know, if Wales were playing Scotland tomorrow... I'd back Wales with the, with the team that they could put out over Scotland. Um, <laughs> off, the, off, the, off the back of what? Uh, well, just the names, well, just 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 some of the names that I'm I'm listing out there. Um, what? Okay, so, so Jonathan so, Davis. So, so Jonathan Davis or Bigger versus, so. versus Finn Russell. So Bigger or Finn Russell? Um, it's a hard one because. Well, how are you even pausing? How are you even pausing when you say that? Arguably, you say Bigger, Finn's I love Bigger. Bigger. I love Bigger as well. Like, Bigger's an unbelievable player. Uh, he gives you balance. Finn will give you magic or it's 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 boom or bust with Finn. Isn't who, it, who doesn't time? like a magician? I know, like everyone, I know. Everyone loves a magician. <laughs> exactly. But then, okay, so you're looking at the back row. England, sorry, you're looking at the back row. Wells's back row could be Lydia, Tipperick and Falatown. If those three get anywhere near their, their peak level, which would they can be, do. Would you get anywhere near their peak level? So you're agreeing with me that they're not at their peak level. Well, who knows? Until you start the game, <laughs> no one's at their peak, are they? You could, you well, know, I'd say, that, I'd, I'd say Jamie Ritchie and Hamish Watson are in and around their peak in terms yeah. of their output. How are they playing for Glasgow and Edinburgh? Uh, do, do you know or not? Have you seen them? Hashtag always. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not doing very well, are they, as, as teams? But well, that's what I'm saying. It's it's a hard six nations to call, probably the toughest for a long time because of all the external factors. Wales. Um, you know, I think success for them will be finish fourth above Scotland and Italy. Um, and I don't mean that in terms of that's actual success. I think, you know, that just gives them a bit more time, Stephen Jones, to keep developing um, on the attack side. And, you know, they need continuity. They need their big names to be... You think of the Gatland era, they had a solid team without many injuries and without much change. And I think that's what he's looking for around consistency of selection and you know, hopefully he'll, he'll see that pivot in the Six Nations because yeah, you want to see Wales compete and you don't want to see Wales... Well, you do want to see Wales get drugged because they're not England. So, um, who knows, mate? Who knows? So, they've got... So, put it in perspective and we can come back to this discussion next week. Wales have got Ireland this week yeah. and then they go away to Scotland next week. So, if they get beat by Ireland, tell the pressure that, heading yeah. up yeah, true. to it's Scotland. True. Yeah, true. But they could beat Ireland and then go and host Scotland as well. So, um, and both things could happen, right? And we'll Scotland, put a wager on that. We'll put a wager on that. I'm well, no, I'm, so, I'm also go saying. Go on, let's put a wager on it. I'm also saying Scotland, Scotland, Scotland could beat England at Twickenham. Ordinarily, I'd say they couldn't because of the fans and the atmosphere and the history. But this year, you just don't know, do you? Yeah, it's a big Six Nations for Andy Farrell as well, isn't it? That's and, the thing. And Paul O'Connell. How good is that? How good is it seeing Paul O'Connell? Paulie. How good is it seeing Paulie? He was in the media with me. He got absolutely dominated live on ITV. And he's like, I can't. I can't do this anymore. This is a joke. He's a joker. He's a clown. And now he's running the show for Ireland with Faz, Big Faz. Yeah, I think he's interlected his rugby IQ around what it takes to win international rugby. Can only help Ireland, can't it? Because he, you know, I've read his book and he is a real student of the game and how people play and train. And, you know, his detail... It'll be similar to Steve Borthwick, absolute Norris fest in terms of line outs. And, and, you know, you can only really tip the slipper to someone that can have that much impact, I reckon. So, you know, where England have had the wood over Ireland is that physicality and the set piece in the games that England have played against them. Ireland, if they want to be competitive, this is an awesome opportunity for Ireland to try and claim a grand slam again in the way that the fixtures lie. They've got France and England at home. Yes, they've got tough away games with Wales and, and Scotland. Um, but Paulie O'Connell could be the difference because since Joe Schmidt has left and they had the disappointment in the World Cup, it's it's not been as an effective Ireland performance that we've seen for, uh, you know, since they beat the All Blacks in, when was that, Andy, right? 2018, 2017? Uh, who knows? Yeah. So they've got the ability, Ireland, but again, it is the who knows. You could see Ireland, I could see Ireland losing to Wales at the weekend. It sounds mad saying that, but I could also see 
you know, Ireland beating everyone before them and, and it going down to the Grand Slam game with England at the death. So it's that's why the Six Nations is so brilliant, even though there's no fans. Well, yeah, the Six Nations is back this weekend and so is the Guinness Pipe Predictor on Match Pipe, which is just as exciting. So you can keep the spirit of the pub alive, even though you have to enjoy this year's tournament at home. It's the same format. Predict the scores, beat your mates, win great rugby prizes. And while free pints are off the table, there are some awesome prizes up for grabs, including signed shirts, ultimate home viewing bundles, and loads of wicked Guinness gear. And you can join the UK's biggest private league with the code RugbyPod. And we have some big news, lads. What? Whoever wins the RugbyPod league outright will win last year's Calcutta Cup match ball, signed by the captains Owen Farrell and Stuart Hogg. I'll also add my name to it as well. If you want real value, <laughs> yeah, go on. I'll put three signatures on there as well. <laughs> Only if you're going to sell it on eBay. Well, let's get your predictions for round one then. England v Scotland. I want to let Jim go first, Dick. It's obvious what I'm going to say. I want to know what a real Scotsman says. Or is he a plastic Scotsman? Well, which, is, he, which? is he voting with his heart or his head? You don't say vote. Can't say vote now. Too, too political. Can't say what? Voting. Hey. I don't know. It's just that when you say vote, it sounds political. Maybe I watch too much news. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to go. My heart says Scotland by four. But if I was to put my mortgage on it, I'm going to go England by six. Uh, by 60? Six. Six. <laughs> six. <laughs> it could have been 60, nearly six out. Of course, it's not going to be. I don't know what the weather's going to do. Not that I'm a weatherman, nor I need to be. No, I'm not. I'm going to go. I'm going to change it again. I'm going to go England by nine. England by nine? Do uh, you believe? I might change my mind later in the week. That, yeah, England by nine. You believe, Jim, you believe. I'm going England comfortably by 18. Eight, off the back of what? <laughs> Tremadols. <laughs> right, so, yeah, Tremadols, Six Nations <laughs> champions and Autumn Nations Cup champions. 18 points. What are you on? Wales v Ireland. I'm going to go Ireland yeah, by... Experts convinced you. I've convinced you. Ireland by eight. Oh, I was going to say Ireland by nine, so I'm going to stick with it. You're sticking with Ireland by nine, Jim? I'm sticking. I'm stick. I'm not twisting. I'm sticking. You might just change it later in the week, though. Italy we'll just say, Actually, I think Italy look better. I think I've seen improvements in there. Maybe not in the scoreline. No, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> first 20 minutes. Let's just say what we say every year. First 20 minutes, first half, they'll be all right. And then France will pull away probably really far back and manscaped all the way up to the top and they will put 20 on them. You think? Mate, the French love a bush though, mate, so I don't think they're fully manscaped. Yeah, it depends. Are these, they're young lads now. Yeah, they're, maybe. They're watching this, they've probably been sold the dream. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, let's um, get your predictions. France by 20. What? 20, 21 now, it's going up. It's going yeah, up. Yeah, it just, just sounds better. <laughs> yeah, mate, the French aren't manscapers either. They, they love a bit of bush. Well, maybe the young ones don't. And they've been listening to the pod. So I'm going to go a bit less. I'm going to go France by 16. Away from home. No on to Mac. Jalibert's good. But it's the first game. Sean Edwards will be just focusing or fucking smashing them. Just get get, get off, man. Fucking smash them. Get get on, on. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go France by 16. Manscaped is supporting us again this week and Valentine's Day is coming up. Manscaped want to help get you sorted and looking sharp. They've got a whole range of products to get you feeling smart, trimmed and looking and feeling your best, haven't they guys? Oh yeah, I got the missus to Manscaped the life out of me before I went into surgery because it's going to be a long 12 weeks on crutches and that's it. That's, uh, that's all I've got. I've been spraying the aftershave. They sent me some aftershave. Absolutely love it. A bit old school. Not like Old Spice. Hand on heart, this is not me being salesy and pushing it out there. I absolutely love the aftershave. I smelled so regal, it was like, I just pictured myself there, that sprayed. My nuts completely clear, a couple of sprouts <laughs> at the back, just because I probably would have struggled to get them in terms of the rotations. And the smell on me, the smell on me, I mean, my lucky wife. Is all I'm saying. She's made. Is that it. what she's saying? No, she's not saying it. She's, no. she's not saying it. No, but she's made it. Join the two million men worldwide who trust Manscaped for their below the waist grooming by getting your hands on the perfect package 3.0, and you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code RugbyPod at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code RugbyPod at Manscaped.com. 
Your balls will thank you. Do you think it's controversial if I was to bring out a woman's skate to not get it? To one for women? No. So woman. No. So woman skate. Maybe no. I could be that guy. It's like that song. Do you remember that? For what I said, it don't mean no. But the person don't move now. And then that Frankie woman brought out that other song to go against his song. And apparently they were together before and it was his arguing with her and then her arguing back with him. Anyway, I could do the same with women's skate. I'll ask the missus, I'll ask Bex if she's happy for me to go down that route and see if she's comfortable go, with me researching. Go go down that route, eh? See what I've done there. See, there's so many different <laughs> lines. I just, I just don't know how unsafe you're it could an be. I'm going to run, I'm gonna run it past Bex. Mate, any more singing from you, Jim, and Goody will think he's back in our booth. Uh, let's, uh, let's bring him back down to earth. Goody, the Premiership, Wasps, who takes 50? Oh, what happened? Oh, I don't know. I've been on Tramadol all weekend. I've not seen any ruggers, boys. What the score that you saw, it happened. <laughs> no, mate, that I, that I woke up on Sunday and I saw that Harlequins had scored 49 points. It wasn't 50, boys. So, what do you want about? Effectively, what? It's, it's not taking 50 if you don't take 50. Only Saracens take 50 and Bath and a few others. But yeah, I mean, it was a perfect storm, wasn't it? Let's be honest. Um, I think Quinns have found their cup final this year. Uh, obviously, they can't play Saracens at home, so they played Wasps. Uh, they found their juices. You know, obviously, people have questioned them. They've made some statements around, you know, moving on from Guzzi and having a culture and all this stuff. And everyone's questioned their culture. And fair play to them. I'm going to hold my hands up. I didn't see that coming. I thought you'd get a bounce reaction. Um, but the perfect storm, Wasps missing a few players. Obviously, with England, Dan Robson had gone. Joe Launchbury's out, injured. He would have been away with England anyway. Um, and that's know. it. <laughs> and that's it. They're missing two players. Pa you? Yeah, Paolo Adogru. Pablo Paolo Adogru. Um, you know, being with the England squad. Jack Willis as well. And listen, it's no surprise that no Jack Willis for Wasps. Will Evans for Harlequins was, he was class. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable. The breakdown, they dominated us at the breakdown. Marcus Smith was phenomenal. I'd be pretty harsh. Jacob Umanger, I think, went missing. Um, and that might be a bit too strong, but, you know, there was mistakes, there was errors, and everything that Quinns did, you get a bounce reaction, don't you? And it was a phenomenal performance by Harlequins. Let's not, you know, dress it up to be excuses around anything else. Quinn's needed a reaction. They've been abject. They've been poor for the last sort of four or five weeks. Um, you know, the players really fronted up, put their best foot forward. And a couple of things you, you say, where, where have those performances been over the last four, five, six weeks? Obviously, there was an issue there between coach and player. The players have obviously gone to the board and said, because he's not right for us because, you know, he's been too hard on us or whatever. Um, and they weren't putting it in the jersey a few weeks ago. But you, you rewind maybe six, six, eight weeks, they did that sort of performance away at Northampton and also down at Gloucester as well. Um, so they've got it in them, Harlequins. We know that they can be a very good side. Obviously, Joe Marler played exceptionally well at Lucid Prop. He wasn't involved with England. Um, you know, Danny Kerr was there and on form and a point to prove after, you know, speaking to the, the CEO a bit about Gustard. Um, you know, Mike Brown, I think he's been frustrated that he wasn't offered a new deal and, you know, he's trying to potentially earn a new deal now. So a perfect storm, tip the slipper to Harlequins. Uh, they were aggressive. Marcus Smith, as Jim said on Twitter, write your checks on, name your price, um, because they should be going to Marcus Smith and saying, here's a four year deal on, and it starts with a five. Um, you, we're building a club around you because he is phenomenal. Um, and we spoke, I think it was last week or the week before about England squads and Eddie Jones with his shadow squad. He's picked Charlie Atkinson, who couldn't get in the match day 23 for Wasps. And I don't mean that in any detriment to Charlie Atkinson because he's a quality young player coming through. But Marcus Smith's on another level. How's he not in the shadow squad? He was phenomenal. Yeah, um, he was fast, front, well, front, front football, they dominated the collisions. They dominated the set piece. They dominated the breakdown. They got quick ball. And we all know you sit off a Harlequins team when they've got their, you know, the, the wind in their sails and they are a very good side. And, you know, Esther Housen was, uh, was physical at 12 and it was the makings of <laughs> what you would have kind of expected a Paul Gustard team to, to show with a bit of extra spice from Nick Evans in attack and, um, you know, credit to the Quinns players and team and the management of the 
coaches for getting that reaction. One swallow doesn't make a summer though, does it? And that's always the issue with Harlequins. You know, they've, they've always got the ability to have a massive performance like that, but consistency is always questioned. And um, you know, time will tell whether you know they can do it week to week to week. Because um, you know, as a Quins fan, that's what you want. Now you've set the bar, um, and that's what you, you expect them to produce. You know, next week in the Premiership, and you know the following six or seven weeks in in terms of Premiership rugby. Do you think they will? I don't know. Yeah. What the, I don't know where the reflection is with Quinns. Is it a reflection on Guzzi, or is it a reflection of the players? Um, you see, with teams, when there is a new coach that comes in, or something happens like that, there generally is a spike. Alex Anderson spoke about when I spoke to him. When he knows that there'll be a spike in adrenaline and energy within the sale team, it's what happens continuously, and that underlines what the culture and what the situations at the club. But you know, it's not my hate of Quinns. A lot of it is tongue and cheek, but. Where is that? Why do you, hate, why'd you hate him? Because of them hating me. <laughs> I don't. I don't hate. I don't hate Quince, But you know, who's the reflection on that performance? There is that a reflection on Paul Gustav not being a great coach, or is that a reflection on the players just not putting it in? Is it up to the coach to make the players want to play for their club? What now, do you think? It was, I, th- I think it's a reflection of the pl- uh, of the players. That's that's what I personally think. So if they back it up and they carry on backing it up, and I'm not saying they need to win every game, but if they play like that, like Goody says, with the physicality and their set piece was dominant, they looked hungry, like they work off the ball, they, they look like a different team. Yeah, and it's a reflection of the coach that they had before. That obviously, he was doing a shit job, but if they do that performance and then it drops off, then it's a reflection of. The Quinn's culture, and in my opinion, you look at their results over recent years, that's what it is. I played against Quinn's for Saracens, and I was like, fuck it, like these, I couldn't believe how physical they were. Like, I was almost in shock with how physical they were. Like, James, James Hallwell smashing into Cruzo, Cruzo gets banjo, he goes off the pitch. Every time they go through um, or make a break, you get patted on the back of the head, or you get in need off the ball in the back. You know, my, my interactions with Marla around, um, the try that they scored, I just, they were niggly, they were physical, energised, like, they were, they were, they were wicked. Whereas, that, that was one game, and, I, and then you watch them, they're unrecognisable the following week. So, Quinns are a club that a lot of players would want to go to, for obvious reasons. They're sponsored by Adidas. What more do you want? You're trying to get, you look incredible. Um, you know, you, you'd wear your stash down the pub, if they were open. Um, you know, they're, in, they're near Richmond, like the demographic of the club. So it's a fantastic history in that club, but they need to sort it out. They need to bring the right person in, whether or not they do bring someone in or they, they keep it as is, as you were, as Liam Gallagher said. This is the thing with them. So, and Jim said it, I alluded to it as well. This has been historically how they've always performed. So we know they've got a big performance in them. But year on year, and you know, if you're still harping on about when you won the league in 2012 by playing this certain brand of rugby, the game's moved on in the eight years that you're talking about. And if you're still harping back to that as a club, then you know that's where you're doing yourselves a disservice. It was only late November and early December when they beat Northampton away and beat Gloucester away convincingly in the Premiership, um, and then they fell off a cliff because he'd obviously not resigned his contract. They fallen off a cliff, got spanked by Bristol, got spanked by. Um, Rassim, and then they pull out a big performance like that. So, yeah, it's consistency and, and whether they've got the ticker to do it week in, week out. And, yeah, that's what champion sides do. It's what Saracens did for years. That's what Exeter are doing at the minute. Um, and it's literally everyone else trying to trying to catch up and, and find that level of consistency. Happened at Wasp last year, didn't it? Di Young uh, left his role. Lee Blackett took over. Um, there was kind of a, a feeling of a release of pressure, not necessarily that Di Young was putting all the Wasp boys under shed loads of pressure. It was just a change of voice, a change of emphasis. And then Wasp went on to win God knows how many games and get to the final and nearly win it or have an opportunity to win it with a line out with two minutes to go. So, you know, these things can happen. And we're saying, we said it before, we're going to see some anomalies in, in results. And from a Wasp perspective, we hope that's an anomaly, getting 49 points on us put at home. Um, but credit to Quinns, they were good. Can they back it up? They go to Bath, I think, this weekend. Uh, Bath will be hurting from, you know, getting their pants pulled down against Bristol uh, on Friday night. And so we All shall right. see. Yeah, how good were Bristol? Front foot, ridiculous. They look favourites in my, my I, I know. My God. I mean, how do you stop that? From every angle, they had 
whether it was going wide, whether it was turnovers, whether it was Nathan Hughes had a big game. Um, you know, Lewis. Uh, yeah, he did have a big game. But... He carried. He carried well, mate. He was, they were physical. They were on the front foot though the whole time. Bath, and I said it on Twitter. I don't know whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. So I've heard rumours that Hooper's lost the dressing room, and then you see a performance like that. Is Stuart Hooper, as DOR, a kind of, and I hate saying this, but a bit of a yes man to Bruce Craig because Bruce is a control freak of, a, of an owner. You just don't know, do you? Um, but I have heard rumblings around the place at Bath that it's not a happy camp um, with the way you know Stuart Hooper is with some of the players, and and that's where you see a performance like that. That's their biggest ever defeat to the nearest and dearest. Um, yeah, Bath aren't in a good place, I don't think. You mentioned your mate uh, Alex Sanderson before. Jim, he got off to a good start, didn't he? So yeah, big win. Leicester have been fairly good of late. You know, a bit of emotion going into that game. Youngsy, Tom Youngs, two hundred games was it? Yeah, two hundred to Leicester game. Welcome yeah. to the club, Youngsy. Two hundred games. And it's a some, lot of games. Some, of, some of us have done that as well, Jim. You know? Yeah, I don't know. It is a thing. I was going to say I don't know if it is a thing. It is a thing. And uh, yeah, so a bit of emotion for them going into going into the game. He scored. Yeah, he scored as well. Um, but again, a bit of emotion from Sale. They've got a good team. And that was a game that could have won anyway. But you could see the kind of narrative around it, Alex Anderson going and, uh, and them going down to Wilford Road and getting the win. Like, under the lights on the Friday. Yeah, the big turning point. Leicester were in charge, I think, for the first 20 or so minutes. Um, I think they were 8-0 eight, eight, eight up. Um, and then Wiggy throws an intercept. Leicester on the attack. Wiggy throws an intercept. Sam James, me old mullet. Honestly, the worst mullet I've ever seen in my life. Dipped in blonde highlights as well. Um, plucks it out the sky and runs it in. He looked like he was treading water, but he ran it in from 70. Uh, and that was the turning point in the game. Leicester were in complete control. And and then Faf de Klerk started kicking well and sales power came through. Unbelievable crossfield kick under pressure from AJ McGinty. Did you see that? Right at the line off his left foot as well. He's right-footed. I'm saying it came off his shin, but it was a perfectly executed kick. And... Uh, Marlon Yard took the, the, the ball and scored in the corner. So, yeah, Sale play well. They're going to be good. We've, we've said it, haven't we? They've got a quality squad. They've now got a leader in Alex Anderson who will get them working well and hard and with enjoyment. And I think that you're going to see a lot of smiles on people's faces playing for Sale. Um, you know, he's a great bloke in the hour. Uh, everyone knows his coaching pedigree and his, his personality as well. He's... They'll be, they'll be playing with smiles on their faces and, and that's half the battle, isn't it? Another defeat for Gloucester, this time at home to Saints. How bad are things at the King's home at the moment? I don't want to say I told you so, Lance, Lance Bradley. What do you say? What do you say? Love Gloucester, love the club, what it stands for, but what do you expect? You look at the changes that have come into that club. Brian Redpath was in with Carl Hogg. Brian Redpath then leaves to go to Sale. It didn't end well at Gloucester. It was a bit of a shit show around that. I nearly left that, that year, the captain, the year I got sent off. Hey, don't let the skipper leave. Don't let the skipper leave. I wasn't skipper then. I was skipper for one game. Okay. Um, you know, we had the bad news that John Brain, who was the forwards coach from Worcester, um, who was at Gloucester at the time, passed away, had a heart attack, which was really sad. Carl Hogg then takes the reins. Carl Hogg then gets moved aside. Nigel Malbrook, sorry. Carl Hogg then, I think he moved aside then. But then Nigel Davis came in, um, the Welsh coach, brilliant, really nice guy. I then left. Loved the night out as well, didn't they? Night before he the game. Loved the fake town as well. <laughs> great, yeah. great lid, great lid on him. Great bloke, yeah. really, really nice bloke. All this, all this time, the whispers going on behind the club. Ryan Walkinshaw, the Walkinshaw family owned the club. They were selling the club. Then they're not selling the club. Then they do sell the club. Then who owns the club? But they're still selling the club. So all these kind of underlying things are happening. And I'm watching from afar, you know, Gloucester, they're one of the traditional teams that people love because of the history and because they're a city um, and the centre of that city and that community is the rugby. But just constantly something, something's going on. People are leaving. Top players are leaving. If you know, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's tough. Your away record is shocking as well. I don't think they've won an away game for 17 or something like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Lance Bradley did an interview, though, saying that he doesn't think there should be relegation from the Premiership this year. No shit, Sherlock. When you're bottom of the league, your CEO is definitely making that statement. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Jim. There's been changes. They, they can only deal in the here and now. Alex King's a good coach. George Gibbonton, good guy, very inexperienced. Um, you know, you hope that they pull through or 
you hope that there's ring fencing so they don't go down. That's their only hope at the minute, the way it looks. I think they'll be all right as a club. They, they're going to be all right. But it's you look forward to next season when it'll be ring fenced. You know, where are Gloucester going to be? Like, yeah. what, you, know, you, you look at you look at the effect as well of, of no fans. That's one of the biggest ones because King's Home isn't an you know, intimidating place to go and play sometimes. And that sometimes wins Gloucester games, that, that 16th man, the shed, that special big family that all stand in the shed together. Um, you know, so they're missing their fans massively. Well, let's finish things off with the good, the bad and the ugly, which is brought to you as usual by Sons, the men's health brand that's helping guys with one of the key issues that they don't often talk about, how to keep their hair. They offer a range of licensed and medically proven products for preventing and treating hair loss, as well as a free online consultation with GPs. And they deliver by a monthly or three monthly subscription service direct to your door. It's reasonably priced with no contract or hidden charges. And most importantly, they get results in nine out of 10 men. So just visit sons.co.uk and use the code rugbypod20 to get 20 quid off your first order. That's sons.co.uk and the code is rugbypod20. Yeah, plenty of good this week. And we're going to start off in South Africa with the Bulls beating the Sharks 26-19 after extra time to win the Curry Cup for the first time in 11 years. I'm a little bit disappointed because obviously I play for the Sharks and it's one of my old teams. But the Bulls, credit to them, winning it first time in 11 years. Big shout out to those boys. Um, we'll go over to the top 14. What's, What's going on at Claremont? Because they've lost time again. Bordeaux. Bordeaux beat them. Bordeaux 37-36. They, 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 they are good. It's they are good. I didn't see it. I didn't see it, but it sounded good. Gone are the days when Claremont don't lose at home games because they've lost a few now. And Bordeaux, the latest team to win their 37 36, hell of a game it was. Staying in the top 14, got to get an old club of mine in the good. Breath, breathe, me old beauties. What's happened with Breath? We beat Toulon 25 23 at home. And we've now won, we, we, being breathe, we, we've now won six of our last seven games. And we've moved up to the heighty lofts. Sorry, we've moved up to the lofty heights of ninth in the top fourteen, Jim. Congrats, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, over to the Guinness Pro Fourteen, Leinster, winning fifty-two twenty-five away at the Scarlets, despite having their under fourteens playing. They had sixteen players away with Ireland. Uh, they were just phenomenal again, back to their best. Where should we go next in the good? We'll go to Wasps. We're going to get Wasps in the good this week, Jim. Why? Surely it's Quinns. A young gentleman called Alexander Goodwin was a virtual signing. Um, they announced his signing pre-match. Uh, he's a young cancer survivor and is now in remission from a rare form of bone and soft tissue cancer in the leg and the hip. So along with Vodafone, uh, WASP partners and sponsors, uh, they helped out with a body-worn camera technology. So he arrived on the team bus with the boys um, and was part of the warm-up. He had his picture uh on the on the post as well so a massive thing for us to do uh, the first virtual signing made in premiership rugby history and what a brilliant brilliant bloke alexandra goodwin is he's fought cancer he's in remission um so a hell of a thing to do from wasp so they get a mention in the good for that for that i'll let you off then yes yes Jim. just this once because i did think that was an incredibly not just good but a good thing so yes. fair play yeah, it certainly was. good on you buddy yeah it certainly was um what else is good? We'll put them in there, Jim. Your favourite team, Harlequins. Uh, Harlequins. Um, we gave them some stick last week, and rightly so, but they bounced I, back. I've, I've not given them any stick. You, mate, you've given them stick for week on week on week, I think. But they bounced back after getting Guzzy ousted. The players fronted up, found some ticker. Hell of a performance. Let's just see if uh, they can do it every week. Because as the saying goes, one swallow doesn't make a summer, does it, James? I don't know. You said that earlier, and I didn't know whether you're about swallow and summoning someone. One swallow doesn't make a summer. The bird. So if that's the riddle, poo bag, that means <laughs> swallows in your life only turn up in the summer. Yes, James. There you go. I mean, that's an easy one. There we go. What else was good? Uh, we're going to go to another old player, actually, uh, an ex-player, Dafford James. Have you heard about this challenge that he's done? Well, I know that he's straight to the hills and the man can run, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to see someone post-rugby who has still got about 0.3% body fat, he is your man. Uh, the former Wales winger and British and Irish Lion has just completed 31 marathons in 31 days throughout January. That's, oh, sorry, that's 812.2 miles of running, rowing and cycling to raise money mm -hmm. for mental health charity, Haffle and Noah's Ark charity. I mean... 
what an amazing thing to do. Noah's Ark Charity is obviously a children's hospice in Wales. Haffel is the mental health charity. I mean, what a bloke. 31 marathons in 31 days in January. I ain't got one marathon in me in my lifetime. Are you, do we even want me to answer your question or my question, the rhetorical question? I ain't either, believe it or not. <laughs> so uh, a big tip of the slipper to Daffy James. Uh, but the good this week has to go to the Bristol Bears, a.k.a. the Bristol Bearbacks, a.k.a. the Bristol Just Give It Semi. The Bristol Semis, we'll call them from now on. Uh, phenomenal performance. They beat Bath 48 points to three, which is their biggest win over them in the 132-year history of the fixture. They're top of the Premiership. They're clear. They're playing a brand of rugby that excites everyone. Everyone wants to watch them play. No one probably wants to play against them. So um, tip of the slipper to the Bristol boys. The bad. Uh, where do we go with the bad? Um, Montpellier. I mean, Montpellier. Lost again, Jim, at home. Could be nine, going down. Yeah, nine straight defeats now. Uh, they lost at home to Racing. At the weekend, uh, it was pretty bad. Didn't see it. No, it was close. It was close, but they lost again. But I think they'll escape because they'll end up in a uh, playoff game against a team from Pro D Dirt if they do finish 13th out of 14. Only one automatic relegation spot in the top 14, which is definitely Ajen because they haven't won a fucking game all year. Um, what else is bad? Gloucester. Five straight Premiership defeats now in a row after losing at home to the Saints and they're rock bottom of the table. Not a good performance by them. I wouldn't say rock bottom, but I'd say bottom. They're only a few points off Washington. It's hardly rock bottom. They're... No, they're, mate, they're rock bottom. What's they're... the rock? Not, not, not the bottom, James. Not the bottom. Fine. So they're, they're on top rock... of the rocks. They're on top of the rocks. But the rocks are on the bottom of the table. Very um, true. I'll take it. So that is bad. Uh, what else is bad? Are you ready, James? Wasps. I've got to say it. I've got Ooh. to put them in there. Got to put them in there. A poor performance. Oh, what, do you mean you, what do you mean you've got... You're trying to justify the fact that you're putting in there. They should be in the ugly. It was uh, absolutely ridiculous how bad they played. It wasn't, mate. It wasn't as bad as Bath. Uh, but Wasps do get a mention in the bad. Uh, shipping 49 points at home to Harley oh, oh. Uh Wasn't a good performance. Got beaten in every facet of the game. Um, so a not good week for Wasps fans, employees, ambassadors. Call us what you will. Wasps will be back, but you have to go in the bad this week. Thing on. Um, that's not very nice, is it, James? Well, no, I just, I just threw it on about people who kind of like Wasps. But they don't, but <laughs> well, you said you liked them last week. I'm a Klingon. Yeah, OK, there we go. So you put yourself in there. Uh, but the bad this week, unfortunately, has to go to Bath. Their biggest ever derby defeat to Bristol's. Uh, they didn't look interested at times. Defence was optional. I didn't think they're all fully committed to the jersey. So Bath have their pants pulled down, their skid marks on show everywhere. And they get the bad this week, Jim. I, don't, I, I think you could have gone either way with them. What's all that? I'll be honest. No, it's, what's your segment, it's your segment. What's, what, what scored 17 points, mate? So, you, you know, Bath only scored three. Um, true, and then true. the ugly. Uh, only one bit of ugly I could find. Yeah, only one bit of ugly I could find this week. Um, and it was Duncan Piawa. Uh, he has a high shot for Toulon and got a red card against Breve. No one goes in high against my old Breve boys. Didn't uh, he got red card in that game. High shot, head to so high shot, shoulders to the head, straight red card, um, and Toulon went on to lose that game. So the ugly this week goes to Duncan Payawa. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, producer Tim, and thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. Leave us a review and check us out on YouTube as well. Rugby pod, come on, Scotland, come on, you can do it. Absolutely no chance, Jim. Pod, pod, pod.